Good evening, everyone. I'm Bill Kelly, Adult Programming Manager for Cuyahoga County Public Library. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, before we get started, I'd first like to thank our partners at the Cleveland Foundation and Annisfield Wolf Book Awards uh, for collaborating with us on this eventful evening. Um, we're really thrilled to have you here with us tonight to celebrate with us because we have much to celebrate. First, Adrian Matika, a 2014 Annisfield Wolf Book Award winner for his poetry collection, The Big Smoke, is here to discuss his new graphic novel, Last on His Feet, Jack Johnson and the Battle of the Century. Following the presentation, Adrian will announce the 2023 Annisfield Wolf Book Award winners. So you will be the first to hear the names of those who will join this esteemed pantheon. All of us, all Clevelanders, are so fortunate to have the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards represent our community. I swell with pride when I tell visiting authors that these awards are based here in Cleveland. And believe me, I tell every author who comes, comes through town. Um, this is an award that has been won by the likes of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Tony Morrison, Colson Whitehead, Maxine Hong Kingston, Isabel Wilkerson, Zora Neale Hurston, and of course, Adrian Matika, just to name a few. The Annisfield Wolf Book Awards are emblematic of our rich literary culture and our powerful literary history. So let us tonight celebrate creating another moment in that history. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Karen Long, manager of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. You have a way with words as well. I don't want to um, kill the buzz by um, sputtering on up here. I am assigned to introduce um, Adrian Matika and Justin Glanville. So you all have phones and can look up information about them. I thought I'd give you one fun fact about each. So Justin Glanville will be speaking with Adrian. He's the senior producer for community storytelling at Ideastream. And he and I met in 2011 when he brought out a book called New to Cleveland. And I still haven't picked my jaw up from the floor over how good that book is. And it is so good that his parents, who lived in Exerbia, decided to move into the city after they read it. The other fun fact to reveal tonight is about Adrian, and it's, there's no picking among children um, in terms of the books, but there is a special place in the Annisfield Wolf Pantheon for The Big Smoke, his poetry book about Jack Johnson. And when Adrian was here in 2014 to accept his prize, he got the other winners' books and had them sign. So far, so typical. But for Adrian, the books were for his daughter. And on his rounds through American literature, he collected these books for her to create a library secretly to present to her when she left for college. So you are in the company of a very, two very wonderful people um, if their families have anything to say about it. So um, I believe we're going to start with um, Adrian reading something to us from his brand new book. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Is that okay? How about you, Justin? You want to try out make sure you're good? Oh. <laughs> there it is. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so good to see all of you. Um, and Karen, thank you. Bill, thank you. Um, I thought I would start by reading a little bit from the book, and then Justin and I are going to talk for a bit. And then I, uh, I'll interrupt it with a couple more pieces of the book to give you an idea of what this project is. So the, this uh, project, Last on His Feet, is about Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight champion of the world. Um, it is part of the project that started with the Big Smoke, but it is not related to the Big Smoke at all, if that makes sense, except for the subject matter. They're two totally different books. Um, I, I knew that I couldn't write another book of poetry um, about, about Mr. Johnson, so I got together with Youssef Dowdy, who is a, a brilliant artist, as you'll see, and wrote this book. There's a lot of language in it that I don't want to put out into the world. And so what I'm going to do is read the overtext, and I'll leave it up long enough for you to be able to read the dialogue um, for yourselves. So that way we'll keep this a safer space than it might be. Men have been locked in combat since before there was money in it. They fought with their hands. They fought with rocks and sticks. They fought over pretty women. They fought over meat and who got to sit next to the fire on winter nights. Prize fighting is just more entertaining version of those prehistoric battles, and I'm the best battler there ever was. July 4th, 1910, dawn came like a comeuppance. The old men in Reno said they had never felt the sun so close. It was the kind of hot that makes water disappear from your glass like magic and boils sweat on the forehead. Eggs fried without a fire. One man's cigar lit on its own. That didn't stop the 20,000 spectators who came in automobiles on horseback and by horse-drawn wagon. Trains ran from all parts of the country every 30 minutes. When there wasn't any more room to squeeze inside, fans rode to the top of the trains. Better to tie yourself in a locomotive than to miss the battle of the century. Of course, Tex Rickard picked Nevada as home for his contest. Of course, he picked Reno. Reno, where, where divorces were as easy to get as a shot of whiskey and just as cheap. Gamblers, sports, prostitutes, and fight fans filled the streets and came with all the cash they could carry. Almost all the bets were on Jeffries. The pickpockets and petty thieves were open for business. All those saps betting against me. What's that saying about a fool and his money? The day got hotter every minute as the sun crested the bright desert, but the sports showed up in their gambling suits anyway. The sawmills and carpenters worked through the heat of the day and by torchlight at night to build the stadium in less than three weeks. The whole place smelled like dust, sweat, and the new pine used to make the bleachers. You could hear the hammers and saws still working as the spectators lined up, but they got it ready. I am ready. I've been ready for this since the day I left Galveston to make my fortune. I'm not fool enough to think fate marked me for any kind of special purpose. We make what we are from whatever materials we are given. I quit school in the third grade and monarchs and rulers still line up to shake my hand. I've been to every country in the world and they still call me champion in all their languages. Listen. A pachyderm is still a pachyderm, whether on an African plane or in a zoo in Chicago. It's not fate. It's just who we are. I'm a prize fighter, and my fists got me here. The best fist a man ever balled up. Thanks to these fists, I've witnessed scenes that poets can't put words to. And thanks to these fists, I'll be the last one on my feet. I think we should stop there.
Thank you. I hope that I was a pace that you could read along with. There's a, like I said, there's a lot of language in this book that's complicated and difficult and also true historically. And if you couldn't follow along, you can <laughs> partake of a copy yourself. I'll do the plugging for you. Um, so it's such an honor to be here um, with Adrian tonight. And um, thank you for, for taking this time. I can't wait to have this talk. Um, and I think one of the reasons, Adrian, that Karen Long put us together is that we have a mutual connection and a guy named Gary Horvath, who runs a boxing gym on West 25th Street yes, on the west side of Cleveland. And I, I was not at this reading, but you were. What was it, maybe eight years ago, nine years ago now? Yeah, yeah it would have been He's... for the, the awards of 2014, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so boxing is something that keeps, in various ways, drawing you back to Cleveland. And um, I'm just curious, because I... I feel really drawn to the sport of boxing, but I have never stepped foot in a ring, probably never will. <laughs> um, don't really even like to watch it that much, but I feel really drawn to just kind of like the sport itself and the culture on the sport. And I'm just curious, like, what, what was your connection, if any, to boxing before you started writing about Jack Johnson? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And, and yeah. Shout out to Gary Horvath. Yes. So that was, the, the, I don't know, out there, Karen, that still is my, probably my favorite reading I've ever done. So it was in a boxing gym, like on the third floor of this old building. There's no air conditioning. These huge heavy bags are hanging down, and they're attached to the ceiling, so they can't take them down to put in chairs. So right. there were chairs around the, the heavy bags. There were a bunch of uh, elementary school and middle school kids there with us. It was so much fun. Um, and that was probably the f last time I stepped into a boxing ring and probably the first time since I was a kid. Okay. <laughs> like, that's okay. not part of my, my, um, my experience. I, was a, I grew up in the, the 70s watching the great heavyweights with my mom. And she was the one who introduced me to boxing and she was also the one who introduced me to Jack Johnson. Um, I thought I was gonna write an essay about my mother's enthusiasm for boxing and learning about this from her. And um, the more I learned about Jack Johnson, the more I, I realized that there was something there that was maybe more interesting than the essay um, and more, more imperative than the essay at the time. And so I wrote a couple poems, wrote a couple more, and then I had a book and realized I had two books, but one of them needed to be a script and not poems. The thing about watching boxing with my mother was that she would get really animated in these fights. Like just, I mean, she, whoever she was cheering for, if that person wasn't winning or we, you know, we got knocked out, she'd say, F that guy, he's no Jack Johnson. <laughs> Which is the first time I heard of Jack Johnson's name. What I found out later, and I don't know, if, I hope my mom's not watching, she hates when I tell this story. What I found out later is that my mom was betting on the fights and so there was a little more imperative to it than just the love of the, of the fistic science, you know. But that's how I, that's how I found out about Jack Johnson. Yeah. And did you, did you draw on your memories of boxing as a kid and writing, I guess this book in particular because it is a graphic novel. And so, like, did you, did you find yourself flashing back to those experiences as a kid? You know, I think that we never get away from those experiences. I, my f biological father wanted me to be a boxer, too. And so if anyone ever had a parent push them into the ring, it's not the kind of thing. I mean, boxing is, is such a beautiful and elegant sport. And I think we get um, the bloodlust of, of Americans sometimes gets caught up in the idea of somebody being knocked out, when in fact it's everything around that, everything that happens before and in between and, you know, Everything that's not a punch that's interesting to me, you know? And um, so when my dad pushed me into the ring with this kid, and I got punched in the nose, I was like, you know what, I'm good. There was, <laughs> there was nothing beautiful about that at all. And so I just never did it again. He's like, well, maybe you're a basketball player instead. I was like, yes. Um, but you know, I'm, as, even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking about the, some of the research. Maybe it wasn't like leaning on personal memory, but I had the idea that because, and I think, 
it, I wish I would have known Gary at that point, but I was, when I first started researching these projects, I wanted to um, find someone who could give me the details of how to train in the way that Jack Johnson would have. Because what I, what I was led to believe, and it turned out to be mostly true, is that um, boxing, boxers right now don't train all that differently from boxers in, in 1910. Nutrition is different, the understanding of how we build our muscles is different, but it's still road work, it's still punching the heavy bag, it's still doing some of the same hand um, speed techniques that they've always used, right? And so I got together with this old time trainer in Oregon and he gave me this list of things to do. And he's like, all right, we're gonna do this starting tomorrow at five in the morning, three miles of road work. And at that point, my daughter was, I think one, and still wasn't all the way sleeping through the night. And I was like, you know, that 5 a.m. thing is probably not gonna happen. <laughs> so I decided to use what poets call poetic license to imagine what it was like to get up that early and run. Um, but I never did it. I did some of the other things though, and it was interesting, <laughs> just not the running. So you, you had put out The Big Smoke a few years ago, and what, and I understand you had done a ton of research for that, right, and part of your, impetus for putting out Last on His Feet was there just you felt like there were maybe more aspects of Jack Johnson's story that you hadn't told yet. Was there like another driving factor that made you want to do this book now to like go back and revisit that research right in this moment? You know, it wasn't that um, anything that was imperative like that as much as it is that I've been working on this book since then. Oh, wow. So this is, this book took 10 years, so Big Smoke took eight. This took 10 years from the moment I had the idea to do the graphic novel to it coming out it was 10 years, yeah. And so part of that was I had to figure out how to write a script. You know, I, had, I mean, I read, I read graphic novels. I've been a big comic book fan my whole life. It seems like something that would be really easy, but that's the thing that everybody mistakes, right? If it was easy, other people would be doing it more often, right? Writing poems is hard. Painting is hard. Writing a graphic novel is so hard. And in that little moment of hubris I had, I was like, oh, yeah, I could probably figure this out in the next year or so. Ten years later. <laughs> you know what I mean? It'll humble you really quickly. You know? And so I had to learn how to write a script. And I wrote a movie script. Um, I had to find an artist to work with. Um, and my agent and I interviewed eight different black American artists and couldn't find a good match. We found one person and he couldn't really finish it. Um, and so I ended up seeing some of the pages from Yusef Dowdy's book about Thelonious Monk, just called Monk. And, and he's, um, you know, he's, he's black, he's Moroccan. He lives right outside of Paris. And the two of us got together and, and hit it off. But that was six years ago. So even inside of that, even after I found the, the, the um, collaborator that I needed, even, uh, even after I found this person who helped me reimagine this story, it still took six more years after that um, before it finally, I mean, COVID had to do with that too, right? And also, um, I love Yusef, so when I say this, I think that if he somehow heard this, he would appreciate it. Yusef's very French, and so when I'd be like, hey, we need to work on this on Sunday, he's like, no. <laughs> we, we don't do things like that on the weekend, you know. And so we, it also took us a while because we had to figure out how to, how to match our styles. But he is a brilliant dude, and it was so much fun to, to work with him. Uh, how many in the audience are graphic novel or comic book fans? Curious. Okay, oh, okay. Folks. Pretty good number. Uh, yeah. Pretty good folks, number. Yeah. Have, you, um, have you had a chance to explore our comic book scene here in Cleveland, like any of the comic shops or anything? Nothing. I, you do know, you find yourself doing that in cities when you, I always love to do that. Yeah, too. yeah. You know, I, anytime I can, I try to build in extra time to be able to do two things, to come to the library if I can, if there's one close by, and to try to find the comic book shop. And so I think um, there's one in Indianapolis that's, that's probably, it's just hometown favorite type stuff. But um, the most surprising place I ever saw was in Harvard Square's Million Year Picnic. Um, and that place was just incredible in terms of that. And so I would love to find the version of that here too. So yeah. suggestions, please. Okay, my personal favorite, and you'll have to ask the audience who, is Carolyn Johns mm -hmm. in West Park. But I'm sure many, I'm sure other people have their opinions as Carolyn well. Carolyn Johns. Carolyn Johns, it's amazing. That's what's up. Um, 
So, okay, so you talked about just how time consuming and intensive it is to work on a graphic novel. Um, you mentioned you wrote a script, but like, can you, can you tell us like, what are the other factors? Like, are you, so do you write the script and then you hand it over to Yusuf, who's the artist? and then he starts his work, like, how do you guys, I'm sure it's not that simple and linear. Like, I'm sure you yeah. go back and forth quite a bit. So yeah. what was that all like? Yeah, you know, that, I think that was the thing that made it take six years, because <laughs> we, we kept going back and forth. Um, so as I understand it, in a traditional arrangement like this, you just hand over the script. But I had never done this before, and I really wanted to learn. And yeah. Yousef had such phenomenal ideas. So I wrote all the text. I had one version of this that was um, that built out a narrative. Yusef came back and was like, this doesn't work. We need to change these things around and you need to write something here. You need a new poem here. And I do that and he's like, okay, now this doesn't work. I gotta draw some new things. And we just went back and forth like that in this you know, truly collaborative way for a long time. Um, and so we got to the point where all right, we told the story. I don't even remember when it became clear. It might not have even been on us. It might have been we ran out of time. But there was a point at which it just felt like we'd done it and we'd framed it in a way that we thought both did respect to the lives lived in the, in the book and also uh, presented it in a way that 21st century readers might be interested in, in looking at. We didn't want to do something like um, you know, like one of these re regular biopics, you know, where he was born here and all these things happened and then he died. We didn't want to have that arc that's very familiar. And it would have been great, you know, his, his life was interesting. But it started with poems, and poems don't work like that. So, you know, we wanted it to mirror the motion of a poem, not the motion of a, a novel or a short story. Yeah, the, the structure is so complex of the book, and I wanted to ask you how you kind of landed on that. So, you know, there's quite a bit of first person from Jack Johnson's perspective, and then there's the, the panels of dialogue, which is, I don't know, it, like that's almost like a documentary style, like recounting of scenes that may have actually happened in real life. And then there are newspaper clippings. There's a little bit from the perspective of Johnson's wife, Etta, so how did that all emerge? <laughs> and like, was that all kind of organic or did you kind of, did you know going in, like, I really want this story to be told from multiple points of view and multiple perspectives? So th this could have been, this could have been a book that was about a boxing match. And you know, what I wanted it to be was about the people who were involved in the match because they seemed more interesting to me than the fight itself. I mean, we're also talking about a fight where all you have to do is like, you know, Google it and you know Jack Johnson beat the mess out of him. What kind of like that just, you know, there's no surprise, there's no drama there at all, right? And so thinking about what the people who were involved in it might have been going through seemed to be, to be the key. We wanted to create a portrait, not, um, you know, not some kind of documentary about him like that. And so we had hundreds of archival pieces and photographs and videos and recordings that we used, um, some of them directly into the, to the book, so we had to get permission for them. Um, everything in the book happened um, about, you know, like in terms of the events themselves, I don't know if that was the dialogue that people were using, but that's, um, the events themselves are what happened. Um, the only change that we made to the facts is we changed the dates re just by one year so Jack Johnson's wife would be in the book more. Because if we'd done it at, when it happened, she would, wouldn't be in the book hardly at all. Oh, wow. And so we wanted her to be a, a, a central figure to the book. And so we had to change that. And there's a note in the front of it that says this. It says, hey, look, you know, we tried to, we didn't change this being flippant with their lives. We changed it so you could see more of it instead of being beholden to that one 1909 versus 1910 change. Right, 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 because they were only married for a year, yeah, year and like, a half, Just something? like not even that, like two two years. Okay, like, yeah. They, yeah. Were, they were only together for a little while. A lot right. of things happened. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, super interesting aspect of the story. Um, you mentioned that you started with the poems. Did I hear that right? So you had the poems first? So we, no, no, in fact, I, it, it, you know, it, I, I think I misspoke in that way. We wanted it to move like a poem. But one of the things after I'd written The Big Smoke, I mean, for me, writing poems is about discovery. 
Like I'm learning something, I'm being surprised by something. I'm figuring out something I didn't know that the poem is showing me, right? Since I spent all that time writing poems about Jack Johnson and his voice and his wife's voice and his mistress's voice, I learned everything that I was gonna learn poetically from that project. And so I was adamant with Yusef. I was like, look, I'm, I'm not writing any more poems, man. This isn't a book of poems. It can move like a poem, but then he'd come back and say, well, you know, we could really use a poem here. And so I ended up writing 40 new poems for this. And I was like, this is the exact opposite of what I wanted to do. I mean, you know, but it's, but I ended, I think I used, I also wrote some short stories. I wrote a lot of stuff for this project because that would be where the, you know, Yusef's, his first language is Arabic and his second is French. And then English is his third language and he's got Russian in there someplace and German. And so there'd be miscommunication sometimes where I'd be like, well, this is what I want this to look like. Can you do this? And he just wouldn't be able to see it and it would just be language stuff. So <laughs> instead of trying to simplify it, I'd write more language, like write a short story. <laughs> and, but it worked for somehow when I would write it as a story, he would see it. So for those of you who end up reading this, it's not one of the pieces I'm gonna show. Um, Jack Johnson's um, mother was enslaved, his both his parents were, and his mother, when the um, Union Army came through, just walked off the plantation like a lot of other people did and followed the army, and that's how she ended up in Galveston. And so I really wanted that information in the book, and Yusef was just like, I don't see how this is anything relevant. Um, this is also one of those places where his understanding of American slavery is very different because he's not American, and so I'd spent a lot of time trying to get him to understand how complicated <laughs> that, that statement is. And so I, I wrote a short story about her leaving, and he was like, I get it now, I see it all, and drew this really beautiful scene from it. It was just something about like, the facts that I was relying on, saying, oh, you know, well, you know how bad it was. He, he didn't know how bad it was. And so I needed to show him in a different way what needed to happen in that moment. But he was really receptive to poems, so I wrote a lot of them, and, and he would draw these really beautiful spreads from them. Yeah, so <clears throat> almost entirely original poems for this. Um, and I checked that with you um, before this, this meeting because I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow, these are all new. Um, so I wondered if you'd read one now for us. Um, this one is from page 95, and then I'll ask you f about it afterwards. This isn't the poem. This is just something I wanted you all to see. Um, it's, it's led into by someone saying some incredibly racist things to Jack Johnson that I didn't want to, to put into the space in this way right now. But one of the last things the guy says is swim back to Africa. And, and Jack Johnson says, you know, what he doesn't understand is I'm a modern black man. And then this is the next page. I'm the newest fashion. And so this is the kind of stuff when Yusef would really get in. I mean, he got in through the whole book, but when he'd come back with pages like this, and I was just like, man, what are we supposed to do with this? That is incredible. So, um, yeah, so that's not the poem. But the next page is the poem. Africa. I'm a full-blooded American of the first rate. I'm from Galveston, Texas, right, in, uh, right by the ocean in the heart of this great land. I could swim, sure, but I've never seen Africa. And when I do, I'll be on a first-class steamer, not in my swimming costume. So one thing, Adrian, is throughout the book, you know, I was really struck by how confident you portray Jack Johnson as, at least in his, the way that he expresses himself, um, confident in his own abilities as a boxer and his worth as a man also really aware of the racism that he was up against. Um, just in the sport of boxing, I guess, um, it was difficult for him to even get white boxers to go up against him in the ring, right? Including Jeffries. Yeah, yeah. Um, was that, how much of his voice, I know you said you included some direct excerpts yeah. from, from his work, yeah. like, mm, was, how much of that was coming from things he actually wrote or said, or, and how much of it was coming from just like what you picked up on from his life story, I guess. Yeah. So this one, I mean, there, there are, um, this is all imagined, this poem is. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are, it's mostly phrases or sentences dropped inside of the, the text in places, and I kind of built out around it like a collage. And um, 
it came from the writing the, the Big Smoke, right? So when I was working on that, it took a couple of years before I wrote a poem because I wanted to make sure I understood what his voice sounded like. And um, to do that, it required the research, um, you know, like the, the close research, the easy one, I, I guess, of something like uh, his autobiography. But his autobiography is ghostwritten and tr in French and then translated into English, so it's not really him. And then there'd be these kind of um, vaudeville portrayals of him in the newspaper where they'd make him sound like, if people remember our gang, sound like buckwheat, um, you know, sound like a vaudeville figure. And then there were recordings where you could hear him talk. And he was somewhere in between all of that stuff. I mean, he, didn't sound, he was a, a really erudite dude. He didn't sound like any, you know, anything at all like the newspaper portrayals. Um, and the, uh, so I was trying to figure out that voice first, trying to get that thing right. And by the time I got, got locked into it, 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 it sort of, I don't know, it just stuck. Mm -hmm. And I was really afraid that I'd gotten it wrong from all of that research until I found um, an unpublished autobiography that he wrote while he was in prison. And it got misfiled in another inmate's case file. So nobody knew this was out there. There's like 80 pages of this of Jack Johnson writing his own story, just sitting there. And, you know, it's all in cursive because the elegance of the handwriting. And um, yeah, it was just I saw it, like, it sounds like this, yeah. you know. And so I don't think that I was doing anything creative in terms of the voice. I think I was lucky to be able to map it. Um, and then I had a whole full thing. So some of this came from the autobiography. Um, the ideas came from the autobiography that he wrote in, in prison. Some of them came from um, recordings I heard of him talking. There's a whole scene that it's just a um, transcript from one, of his, from one of his performances. So things like that. And as long as it stayed in the same kind of vocal register, it seemed like it would we'd be able to manage it. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, maybe that's where the poetry comes in, is yeah. like filling in the gaps that we don't have archivally. And you know, it's really striking reading your book that he, he really did cross the color line in so many ways in his lifetime. He married a white woman. He did succeed in convincing or persuading white boxers to go up against him, and he defeated <laughs> many or most of them. Um, so I was hoping you'd read the, your, the next poem that we have picked out, which is called The Color Line, and then maybe we can talk a bit more about that afterwards. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. You see, the, the poems I picked are all really short because I didn't know how many poetry fans would be here. So I, didn't want, I didn't want you to sign up for a recitation. All right. The Color Line. Imagine being the best at what you do and the folks in your profession won't allow you to ply your trade. You might be the best carpenter in New York State, but no, and nobody will hire you to pick up a hammer. You might be the finest surgeon in the entire United States, but nobody will let you operate. That's what it was like for me. I was the best to ever put on gloves, and none of the white prize fighters would give me a shot at the prize. And then right after this is a series of cartoons from the newspaper that that trace the way that what he had to do <laughs> to, to actually get a shot at the title. Um, the guy he beat was named Tommy Burns, and Tommy Burns was 5'7 and 170 pounds. And, you know, I mean, you can see his back is, is bigger than that, you know. Um, Jack Johnson was like 6'2 and 240. And so anybody over 170 was a heavyweight. Um, and so when the two of them got into the ring, one, uh, Guy on the, one of the reporters on the on the side described it as a great Maltese cat toying with a white mouse, and that's the kind of ways that they would anthropomorphize Jack Johnson, you know. Um, but they wouldn't let him fight. So Jack Johnson chased Tommy Burns all over the world, challenging this guy to fight. He basically, Jack Johnson basically bankrupted himself to get a shot at the heavyweight title. So Tommy Burns, the heavyweight champion, is in you know, London to fight somebody. And Jack Johnson would show up in the front row. Look, you, know, you're, you, know, you need to fight me. I'm the, you know, I'm the number one contender. Very Muhammad Ali, right? Um, you know, fight me. I'm the real one right here. I'll fight you for free. And Tommy Burns would be like, nope, not fighting anybody black. Then you go to Paris to fight somebody. And there's Jack Johnson in the front row. You're scared of me. I could tell well, the first time I saw you, you were afraid to fight me. I'll fight you for free. Let's just do it. 
nope, not doing it. And he did this. He hopscotched all over the world following Tommy Burns. He was on his last dimes. He borrowed everything he could when they were in um, Australia. And Tommy Burns was like, fine, I'll, I'll fight you for $30,000, which was like triple what anybody had ever gotten paid for a fight before. Just assuming nobody would put 30000 up and everybody showed up to put that money up. And that was the end of Tommy Burns, you know. Um, but to do that, to tell that story, it's one thing for me to share it, you know. Um, it's another thing to try to put that in the pages and make it interesting, given the fact that it involves travel and it involves all kinds of other movements that you have to account for in, in a graphic narrative. So we decided to do it like a cartoon with Tommy Byrne just running off all the time with a little cloud <laughs> behind him, you know. And Jack Johnson would be like, well, I gotta chase this guy every place. And so that's how, that's how we solved the problem of um, Tommy Burns being a coward. Yeah. So Adrian, how, how much do you think Jack Johnson shifted the culture? I mean, after he did defeat Jeffries, there were race riots in multiple cities. Um, like, what were, the, what were the repercussions of what, what he did in his boxing career, do you feel like, and just the culture at large? Yeah, it's, it's really, um, it's, yeah, that, I mean, that's a great example of what happened. So right after, so it wasn't like this when Tommy Burns lost. People were like, well, he wasn't really the champion. He's just kind of there. The real champion is Jim Jeffries. And, and so when he beat Jim Jeffries, then that's when everything went crazy. Like people, um, there were, the, a church got burned in Indianapolis, two men got killed on a, a streetcar in Little Rock. Like there were multiple <laughs> murders and, and lynchings after this fight just because Jack Johnson won. You know, people were so angry they were just not, they weren't having it. And so I think the, the changes that happened with Jack Johnson being, being the champion happened before that, like led up to that event, those events, and then also reverberated later. And what I mean is that, um, Imagine what it would have been like for some of these, just like, you know, not the, the, you know, the, like the, the kind of really aggressive racists, but just like run-of-the-mill racist people at the turn of the century, you know, who are just part of this culture, part of what they've known. They're not actively being that way. That's what Jim Jeffries was like. He's like, I don't want to be around black people, but I don't really, you know, I don't mind them being here. He was, like, you know, he, he was a stand-in for other people's racism when he got into the ring. Um, but then there were other people who were deeply invested in these, these dynamics and still are, right? And those people, many of whom were in power, just they threw it all after Jack Johnson. And so, you know, if you didn't know this already, I'm sorry that I'm, um, like I'm jumping ahead. I should just let you hopefully read the book or read Unforgivable Blackness from, um, you know, watch the Ken Burns documentary or Jeffrey Ward's book. But um, he got convicted of the Mann Act, which is bringing a woman across state lines for the purposes of prostitution. Um, because one of his mistresses was a former prostitute, and when his wife said, I don't need her around anymore, you gotta send her, send her packing, she got mad and, and turned state's evidence. So he got, and, <laughs> all right, but he also, okay, so his, his, her name was Belle Schreiber, she was a prostitute at the like most prestigious, is that right? The kind of right loose um, <laughs> brothel in Chicago, and black people weren't allowed. And Jack Johnson took her out. So the the brothel keepers were angry. The aldermen were angry because he was messing with their money to start out with. So there are all these other levels of power that were also um, stressed out by Jack Johnson. And so when Bell got so angry and talked to the Department of Justice. And they said, well, you know, the, your, your, your testimony is not enough. And she's like, I have receipts. And she had actual receipts. Like I know the kids used to say, you know, keep receipts. Jack Johnson would have her come with him someplace and stay in a hotel, but she had to pay for it him, herself. And then he would reimburse her. And so then like a business expense. And then she would, so she had to show him the receipt for the hotel where they stayed, or the dinner that she bought or the train she took. So she came with a box full of receipts from travel that she did with Jack Johnson across all kinds of state lines. And so he's out here thinking he's keeping his game tight, but he actually provided the government with what they needed to, um, 
to get him. And so when I started finding that stuff, I was like, my God, did you really do that? And she kept all of the receipts, every one of them, and gave them to the Department of Justice. And so he was, I mean, he was done for to start out with, but that was, um, yeah. That didn't end up in the book, though, because we couldn't figure out how to draw the receipts. <laughs> you know, we're like, like, is it just going to be a box of them? Is it going to be, you know, does she keep them in a, f a file folder? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, we, have, we have one more, this is actually a non-poetry yeah. excerpt that we wanna, we wanna get in here. Yeah. Would you mind reading this next one? Um, Adrian, it's, it starts Fred Fulton, the giant of the North. Yeah, yeah so sorry about that. This, that's not a good segue. My, my story wasn't a good segue into what's next. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is about the great white hopes. And so that's what, you know, when we talk about Jim Jeffries, he was the, the original great white hope. But then, you know, um, before him, there were all these other ones. And um, so, and a lot of them were called giant. All right. I took the heavyweight championship from Tommy Burns and nobody was taking it from me. Not President Roosevelt or Tex Rickard or the Great White Hopes. There were so many of them. George Rodell's chin was so weak they called him the diving Venus. And all those giants, Fred Fulton, the giant of the North, Gunboat Smith, Jim Coffey, the Irish giant. Carl Mo Mo Morris, the Salupa giant. They tried, and they all got dropped just like cherries from a tree. Jim Jeffries could have, could have stayed, it could have stayed in the ring, it couldn't have stayed with me in the ring before his retirement. What did he hope to do in the ring with me other than bleed? There's only one real giant, Jack Johnson, the Galveston giant. So, you know, another example of that voice we were talking about, about just that, um, you know, very, the bravado, the confidence. Yeah. I'm wondering, Adrian, you know, as you're writing the book there, I was like, wow, did this guy ever give himself a chance to feel vulnerable, to feel um, like he could be less than the best, like the best, the most strongest, most strongest, the strongest. Yeah. Um, the one moment that kind of jumped out at me was after his wife kills herself, and he does, you know, that he does kind of have a bit of a breakdown there. Yeah, yeah. But like, I guess did he did he allow himself more of those moments, or was he just not able to, being a boxer, being a black boxer in particular? Yeah, I don't think that there was um, any way that he could have been vulnerable, given how how much of the system, how many people, how much of the, the shape of his life was in opposition to him even being here, you know? I mean, we're talking about a man whose parents were enslaved, and so his entire life from the jump was shaped by violence. Before he was a boxer, his parents had endured violence that's incomprehensible. And then he's there, and he's receiving that same kind of treatment from the system, even before he gets into the ring, you know? Um, to try to try to show any kind of vulnerability in the face of that kind of pressure, I just I can't imagine he would have been able to survive, you know. And then the other part of this is that he wanted to be seen as a um, as a gentleman. He wanted to be seen as a worldly man. And we're also talking about this again the, the time period. He's being treated as if he isn't even human still. So so much of this book is about him saying, "I'm a man. I'm a man." You know, I'm a human, and you treat me in this other kind of way. And so I think um, he wouldn't have been able to. And so trying to bring in some of that, that texture to this ended up being about his face and about his, his quiet time, his alone time, not about him making big, like really big pronouncements about being sad or being vulnerable or something like that. Because he's also a part of the kind of very aggressive masculinity of the early, you know, the early 20th century. It's extending out of the, the late, you know, the, the late uh, 18th and 19th century go west young man, that kind of stuff. I mean, he's part of all of that. Yeah. And um, shaped by it even as he's trying to reshape it. I mean, you asked a question earlier about um, how things changed. And one of the things that struck me about this, the, just this whole project, is that Jack Johnson was part of, in one way or another, so many profound, profound historical events globally, 
right? I mean, maybe not a direct agent in them, but he was, um, he was around for the Mexican Revolution. He was down there with Pancho Villa and Emilio Zapata. He was in, um, he was in Spain in World War I, acting as a spy for the US government who was trying to get him into prison anyway. He was, um, he was around for the Titanic and for the Wright brothers and the, the Model T and all the telephones being in people's houses. He was in this space where everything around us changed. The Great Depression, you know, uh, World War II. He was around for all of this. And at one point, he's a kind of a, he's an active agent in them. Like he's part of the change that's happening in the world where he's demanding that black people be seen for their brilliance. And then later he's not anymore. Later he gets arrested and he still thinks he's that, but nobody's paying attention to him anymore. And the story that I wanted to, to, to tell about that is that the next black heavyweight champion after that was, um, was uh, Joe Lewis. And Jack Johnson came to Joe Lewis's people and was like, look, I will train you. Like, I, I can do this, let me teach him I'm the best boxer that's ever lived. And they were like, absolutely not. You are not getting near our dude. He is a good American. He's not like you. And so even in all of the things he was trying to do to get people to see him, he still ended up exactly where they wanted him to be, ostracized and, and forgotten, you know? Really, though, not anymore, I feel not like. Not anymore, no, right? not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We're revisiting it, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, Cool. Well, do we have time for a couple of questions, powers that be, from the audience? Okay. Or do we need... Yeah. We do? I, yeah, we have, I think we do. Right okay, now. great. Does anyone have any... We want to open it up for anyone out there who might have a question or two about... I see my man with the hat up there. What's that? I, said, I see my man up here. I, I, I guess it's, it, the light's on you, my man. I just see your hat, and it's looking good. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's the first <laughs> person you. I saw. Okay. I just have a comment and a question. So I looked up your profile, and all I have to say is go Saluki. I, I, I'm a Saluki, too. Fellow Saluki. Uh, SIU. Mm-hmm. How do we, or, or do you think your book keeps Jack Johnson's legacy for being radical? And how would you want, I have a 12-year-old son. How would you want black boys to read this novel? I mean, to read this book. Yeah, go Salukis. You know, that's, that, that's what's up, man. Yeah, you know, and thank you for that question because I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, you see, um, even in this space, when I'm like, well, I'm going to not read these parts of it because they need to be there, but I don't really want them to be a part of the way I, I offer this book to you. There is so much violence in the book and there's so much pain, and it's also historically accurate. You know, and so it's this thing where I feel like everybody should read it and also be aware that what, of what they're walking into. And in a lot of ways, Jack Johnson made it possible for the next generation of artists and musicians and, and athletes to do what they needed to do. And that generation made it possible for the next one. You know? And so I think that what he is is he's a trailblazer, even as he is an absolutely imperfect human being. You know? And so I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't put, and my daughter actually called me out about this at some point, I wouldn't put a picture of Jack Johnson on the wall and say, we all need to be like him. But if we can achieve like him, that's something different. I just think that there's some things that pop up in the book that make it, to make it a little bit difficult for him to be a role model, given the way he treated his wife and some things like that. Um, but recognizing that history and recognizing how the things we do now are built on it, you know, whatever it is, I mean, the first is always the most difficult, whether it's Jack Johnson or, or Willie May or, or, or Barack Obama or, you know what I mean? Like, it's to be that first person standing in there all and all that heat so other people won't have to do that. It's, it's exceptional and necessary to acknowledge. Yeah. Is uh, Jack's handwritten autobiography somewhere where we could read it? Um, I got it out of the National Archives. I mean, it's not really, it's not much of a read. It's, it, it's pretty, it's like, you know, like five or six pages and he gets bored and wanders off and comes back and writes some more. I mean, it was a great read for me, but it just like in terms of a, a page turner, it's not exactly that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was like, it, wasn't, it was like maybe 10 bucks for me to get, the, get a copy of it from them. Um, and I'd hoped at one point when he still had relatives alive who were trying to um, shepherd his legacy that we might be able to try to figure out how to package it as a new, um, as a book. 
but that kind of that kind of didn't happen. Um, his great great grandniece, who was kind of the spokesperson for their family, died um, right after COVID. So I'm not sure where that stands now. Um, yeah, it's in the National Archives. Yeah, maybe time for one more. If anybody's got it, yes, sir. Twenty years ago, there was a Broadway play, The Great White Hope. Mm -hmm. Did you ever had a chance to see it? I think it was into a movie. Yeah. Afterwards. You know, I saw the movie. I didn't see the play. Are you talk, um, talk about Howard Sackler's play. Yeah. Um, I didn't, but it had uh, James Earl Jones playing Jack Johnson, which was amazing, and Jane Alexander playing um, his wife, Etta. But neither of them were named that. I think his name was Jack Jefferson or something like that. Um, yeah, so I have a complicated relationship with that because a lot of it was um, factually inaccurate. But the actors did so great <laughs> that I was like in this weird space where like, well, I, I appreciate the work that's being done here, but like the facts of them were wrong. And so coming into it from a historical perspective rather than a fan perspective led me to this because I didn't see it before I read, started researching. Then I saw it and I was like, oh man, James Earl Jones was incredible. What about the Ken Burns biography? I didn't watch that till I got done either and it was great. You know, um, for those of you who haven't seen this or but are interested in maybe a more streamlined version of it, um, the Kim Burns documentary has incredible archival footage and video and has um, Samuel Jackson reading Jack Johnson's biography or, or his autobiography, excuse me. And so for those of a certain age, you don't imagine Samuel Jackson as the guy on the Capital One commercials, um, but rather as Julius from Pulp Fiction. And so I kept thinking about, I kept hearing my man from Pulp Fiction with the Jerry Curl reading Jack Johnson stuff, and I loved that <laughs> so much. So yeah, though that, that was fantastic. It's, it's a really, really beautifully and thoughtfully rendered documentary. Yeah. Thank you for bringing those up. Um, I think that we need to, I need to. Yeah. All right. Transition. We need a drum roll. <laughs> Okay. Thank you all. I'm sorry. I, that was like an awkward transition. I've been looking so forward to this the entire time I think, and, and for, you know, not just to talk with you all, but to be back here. It has meant so much to me to be a part of the Annisville Wolf community and the Cleveland Foundation has been so good to me and being here at the library is just, it's just overwhelming. I can't tell you what, a, um, what it's meant not only to, to my work, but also to, to the way I think about working, to be honored with the Annisfield Wolf Book Award. So I get the unbelievable pleasure of announcing the, the winners of the, the 88th annual Annisfield Wolf Book Award. 88 years. It's amazing. Um, I'm just going to name them, and then you can look up this beautiful press release later. The first winner I'm going to announce is Geraldine Brooks. Her book, Horse, is a beautiful book of fiction published by Viking. Geraldine Brooks. Lands, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I should do. I should, I, I should um, maybe I'll lead the claps. I should have done that. I was just like sitting there thinking about how excited I was when I heard my name. <laughs> just like, wherever you are, Geraldine, I'm so happy for you. Lan Samantha Chang, The Family Chow, published by W.W. W. Norton. Oh, man. I mean, it really is transformative. Matthew F. Delmont, Half American, The Epic Story of African Americans Fighting World War II at Home and Abroad. It's a beautiful book of nonfiction published by Viking. Oh, not to be biased, but the next person's a poet. <laughs> Saeed Jones, <laughs> Columbus's own, uh, Alive at the End of the World from Coffee House Press. Oh, man, so good. And the last, the la last awardee is 
uh, Charlene Hunter Galt. Um, you know, I'm going to read something. I got to just, because it's not for a book, it's for a lifetime. So I'm just going to read just a little bit of, of this about um, Charlene, Charlene Hunter Galt is 81 years old, made history and chronicled it as a journalist, an author, and a lecturer. Alongside her high school classmate, Hamilton Holmes, she desegregated the University of Georgia in 1961 amid tots, tear gas, vandalism, and a riot. I'm going to stop there and let you read the rest of it. This is someone who dedicated their life to making things. Thinking about what we were just talking about a second ago. This is somebody who changed things so we were able to do it differently. And I'm so pleased that we get to honor her um, with this award. Congratulations, awardees. I'm so pleased to know your work and be able to be part of sharing it with everyone else. Thank you all. We have Adrian's book right here, if you are tempted, as well as um, the new winners. So your relationships can begin, and they can enter a lovely new um, phase when they all come to us September 28th at the Mulch Performing Art Center. I hope you'll all be there. I look out and I see the original gangsters of the Annisfield Wolf Book Award. Thank you for coming. Thank you for caring about this. Thank you for making them so Cleveland. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.